Hey everyone, how's it going? The video title speaks for itself. Some people played this new game by catching every Pokemon. Some tried to play through it with just Shinies. Me? I'm gonna see if I can beat it with just Bidoop. I was told upon review that these games were too easy. But let's see how easy they are when we have to use just a Bidoop. Now for those of you who are new, my rules are simple. We don't use the items menu in battle just like in a multiplayer battle, so held items perfectly fine. We also aren't going to use any Pokemon in our team except for Bidoof. In previous generations, we need Pokemon for HMs. Thankfully, we don't really need them, although if we did, that would be acceptable. And finally, I'm not going to use Double Team. This is something a lot of challenge runners like to abuse. It's boring. We're not going to do that. Pretty much it. And so with that said, it's time to start the run. Now, unlike in my red and blue runs, we don't have a game shark to change our starter into Bidoof. Instead, what I'm going to do is simply catch a Bidoof in the wild. They're available fairly early on, and frankly, that's good enough for me. Now, in terms of catching a Bidoof, ideally it would be at level 5. We're going to actually catch one at level 3, because they're easier to find on Route 201. And Bidoof has two abilities. One of them is Unaware. Unaware ignores stat changes, and that's kind of useful, but more useful would be its other ability, Simple. Simple doubles the effect of all of your stat changes, meaning if you were to use Meditate, for example, you would gain two attack instead of one. Swords Dance, you would gain four attack instead of two, which means rather than getting times two attack, you actually end up getting times three attack. Not bad at all. Unfortunately, there is a flip side, meaning stuff like Growl and Leer will also double, but I figured that was a worthwhile compromise. And so with our simple Bidoof, we're going to try and make our way through the game. And right off the bat, I was encountering issues based on the fact that it was a simple Bidoof. You see, later in the game, I don't think this is going to be as big a problem, but in the early game, most Pokemon know a status move, typically one that lowers attack. And basically starting with minus two in attack, when you're around the same level as all the Pokemon, and they have multiple Pokemon, the beginning was quite a slog to say the least. And rival one, so to speak, I guess it's technically the second rival battle, but it's our first one with Bidoof, was actually pretty frustrating. Thankfully, by level nine, Bidoof gets a combination that you may have seen in my Shuckle run a few months ago. That combination is Defense Curl and Rollout. Rollout is insanely powerful, and when paired with Defense Curl, it's really, really good. You think I might be using it for the rest of the run, but unfortunately the big drawback to Rollout is that it's only 90% effective, and you're locked into it for five turns. With Generation 2's AI, that wasn't too big a deal, but I'm going to tell you right now, Generation 8, for all the flaws this game has, the AI is quite a bit smarter and it's just not ideal to do that. With Starly leading off, you tended to get growled, which really, really stunk, but with enough perseverance, we were able to make it through. But it was a bit of a hollow victory. Because I knew that upon beating Rival 2, essentially, I would have to eventually challenge Rourke. And like a lot of times in the early game, you're pretty limited in what you can do at this point. And in fact, post-Generation 5, it actually gets a little bit worse. Let me explain. You see, in Generations 1 through 4, how many experience points you got in a battle was set in stone. There was a calculation based on an opposing Pokemon's base HP, whether it was a trainer or wild Pokemon, and whatever that number was after you defeated it got it added to your total. From Generation 5 onward, despite the fact people claim Game Freak keeps making the games easier, this actually intended to make it a little more challenging and less just level up to win. Because the amount of experience points you get decrease the higher the difference between your level and the opposing Pokemon's level. And since most of the wild Pokemon are like level 5, 7, 8, 
they're not very high. Trying to get Bidoof to a super high level, like we did in my Shedinja run to get past Rourke, it's not gonna go all that well. It's possible. But holy moly, is it going to be time consuming? Thankfully, we do get a couple TMs along the way that are going to help us. The first is Workup, which we get from the school in Jubilife City. And the second thing we're going to get is the TM for Rock Smash. Now, Rock Smash is super effective, but it's pretty low base power. And even after Workup, which, because of my simple ability, will essentially be the equivalent of a Swords Dance, Geodude uses my strategy against me, by which I mean it uses Rollout, and destroys me. The days of the Geodude just having Tackle and Defense Curl? Those are gone. Most of the trainers in this game actually have movesets that make sense for the teams they have, especially the difficult trainers like Gym Leaders. Now, as you watch me get utterly destroyed by this Geodude, you might be wondering how the heck are you going to win? I mean, level up a bunch? And yes, we're going to have to level up a bit, but we're also going to manipulate the AI in Generation 8, because while it is better, it's still not perfect. And it is manipulatable. I figured out that by starting with the Defense Curl and then going for a bunch of workups, which, to be honest, is not just for this Geodude, but also for the remaining Pokémon, I could get Geodude to keep using Defense Curl for a long time, at least until pretty much I maxed out my workups. I'm not exactly sure why this was, but it was super, super helpful. With max attack, I'm able to do a decent amount of damage, and don't forget, there is a 50% chance that Rock Smash lowers Geodude's defense. Thankfully, we also got a rollout miss. The reason we use Defense Curl, obviously, is to mitigate the damage from said rollout, assuming it hit. With that miss, and the defense drop we got via Rock Smash, Geodude decides to go for another Defense Curl, and we're actually able to knock it out without taking any damage. Obviously, the 10% rollout miss played a factor, but, hey, we have a level 13 Bidoof. Give me a break. Next comes Onyx, and Onyx outspeeds Bidoof. Yeah, Bidoof's pretty slow. And Onyx uses Rock Throw. This is a base 50 power move. It hits decent damage it does to me. Rock Smash, I mean, Onyx has super good defense, so I wasn't expecting a knockout. It did pretty good. Onyx goes for another Rock Throw, and thankfully we're able to knock out the Onyx. We level up, so we're going to be at 32 HP for the Kranidos. Well, Kranidos goes for Headbutt, it doesn't do very much damage, I don't get flinched, and I'm able to knock it out with Rock Smash. And in just two hours, we have defeated Rourke. All things considered, that is pretty great. However, it doesn't get easier from here on in. I mean, it gets easier for a little bit because we don't have any difficult trainers, but eventually we have to go to the Valley Windworks, and there we have to battle Commander Mars, and I'm not going to go into too much detail because this video is already going to be very lengthy, but it just illustrates how terrible Bidoof is at this run. We face a Zubat and a Perugly, and I get knocked out in no time. We get a U-turn, we eventually get a fake out, and yeah, I, I stand no chance. I mean, I'm not even out-leveling the Perugly because of the experience point system. I'm using just one Pokemon, and I'm under-leveled, and I've tried to battle as many trainers as I can. In the end, I did level up a little bit, but I realized that the easiest way without leveling up too much was to try and rely on an item we get fairly early on, the Quick Claw. In the end, I do get it activating a couple times. I'm not sure if it really helped. It's more that Perugly didn't use anything too terrible, and thus, we basically ended up getting lucky in a bit of a different way. The Quick Claw can help if you're both one turn away from being knocked out to get that finishing blow. In the end, we actually got a little unlucky against Zubat, where one of our rollouts missed, we were hit by Supersonic, and thankfully, Confusion only has a 25% chance of actually harming you in this generation as opposed to 50, and so we were able to knock out the Zubat. I spent almost as long on Mars as I did on Rourke. So, if you thought for a second that defeating the Rock-type gym leader would mean that things are going to get easier, 
like I said, think again. And the next difficult trainer we have is Gardenia, the grass type gym leader. Now by this point, I've leveled up enough that Bidoof gets a brand new move. A move that's going to prove very useful in this battle, Yawn. Now Yawn's not the best, it takes a couple turns to work. But, assuming you're dealing with a Pokemon like a Cherubi, which can't do all that much to you, yes, it's going to get two attacks. But, after that, it's going to fall asleep, and we can set up, hopefully, long enough to help us win. While we no longer have Defense Curl, roll out on its own, assuming the Cherubi cooperates, will be enough to knock out every single one of Gardenia's Pokemon. The question is, will we survive a hit from the Rose Raid? Rose Raid deals about 40 or so damage, so we need at least like 20-ish HP remaining in order to survive Grass Knot. It does vary slightly. All my losses typically were that I was able to get through both the Cherubi and the Turtwig, but the Rose Raid would use Grass Knot and that was it for Peanut Butter. Finally, however, we were able to get a battle where the Cherubi only used Dazzling Gleam a single time and I wasn't attacked thereafter. Because I wasn't attacked more than that, I had enough HP that once I finished setting up all my workups, I was able to knock out the Cherubi, followed by the Turtwig, in just a second. I should note that one reason I really like recording with Generation 1 is that since the graphics aren't too intense, it's very easy to speed up or slow down the footage in order to match my voice. Sometimes it looks a little choppy, but with Generation 1 graphics, it's normally okay. Here, I'm having a little bit more time syncing everything up. Anyway, I tank the Grass Knot from the Rose Raid, knock it out, and I will say that while Gardenia wasn't easy, it took me, I think, five or so attempts. She definitely, of the difficult trainers, was the easiest so far. So, yay, I guess? Now, there is another short Team Galactic section, but thankfully, it was a second try victory. The big thing here is that Skunk Tank has Aftermath, so you need a little bit more HP than you'd otherwise think, because if you use a move that deals contact damage, like Rollout, it's going to deal a quarter of your HP back, but it wasn't all that difficult, and we can move on. And you see, as someone who loves Platinum, I made a bit of a miscalculation, forgetting that, in fact, it is not Fantina, the ghost-type gym leader that would be next, but in fact, Maylene, the fighting-type gym leader. So we faced a rock-type gym leader and a fighting-type gym leader. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. I mean, Bidoof is slow, doesn't hit very hard, and uh, oh yeah, it's pretty frail. This is going to be an absolute nightmare. Now, thankfully, it takes like five years to actually get to Veilstone City. So we're going to level up a fair bit. And in Diamond and Pearl, I figured out that there was a TM that Bidoof could learn that might make Maylene doable. That TM is Pluck. And unfortunately, I didn't realize Bidoof could even learn Pluck until I'd made it to Veilstone City. So I had to backtrack, which sucked. But, it did mean that the trainers in Maylene's gym weren't too bad. But you might be thinking, Jero's Pluck is a base 60 power flying move. How is that going to be all that helpful? Bidoof doesn't have great attack. That's a, that's a good point. And this is where Simple really comes into play. Sure, it was nice turning workups into Swords Dance. But, the Veilstone department store has some of the most useful selection of TMs ever. Including, of course, Swords Dance. As I mentioned earlier, that's a plus four in attack after one use. So I was able to defeat all the trainers in Maylene's gym. Unfortunately, Maylene herself proved problematic. You see, her Meditite could not attack me, but if it did, it was a one shot. And then the one time I made it to Machoke, because it used Flash and I have Simple, I didn't hit. But you see, I should have done a little bit more research before even beginning this battle, because what I didn't realize is that after the Machoke comes Lucario, a Steel-type Pokemon, which thus is not weak to pluck, outspeeds me, 
and absolutely annihilates me. I'm not going to lie. I almost gave up right here. Because what are we going to do? Overleveling is very tedious and a very boring strategy. Lucario is going to outspeed me for a very long time. It has great base speed. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Thankfully, at least in terms of doing damage, you can get Dig just south of Veilstone, so that part we could work on. The issue was actually surviving to use Dig. So let me illustrate a battle and how things would normally go. So we have our Metatite. We're going to set up a Swords Dance, right? Well, it goes for Flash, and it hits. So I'm now going to miss a bunch. Beautiful. I use Pluck. Of course, it misses. It goes for Bulk Up. Hopefully, I'll be able to hit here with minus 2 accuracy. That's not guaranteed. But, oh, it outspeeds me. Beautiful. And wait a minute. What happened there? Well, you see, once you get to Hearthome City, you can have your Pokemon follow you around, which raises its affection. And like in previous games, if your Pokemon is high enough affection, it can sometimes survive on 1 HP when it should otherwise faint. Thankfully, I am able to hit with Pluck and knock out Metatite, but like, you know, we have two more Pokemon to face. We're done. I mean, odds are we're not even gonna... Uh, okay, well, we hit the Machoke. Beautiful. But now we have Lucario, which outspeeds me, and I'm minus two. So, yeah. That's gonna... Oh... Okay. <laughs> Please hit. Please hit. <laughs> yes! The power of friendship! Oh, God. I mean, I know that seems extremely cheap, but what would you want me to do here? We could level up to, like, level 50. That would work. But, like, there was nothing else. I was stunned when this happened, and I was very close to resetting... But then I realized, who cares? You're doing a Bidoof run. Do you think anyone out there is like, oh, you didn't do this Bidoof run as hardcore as possible? Who's doing a run with a Bidoof? I mean, seriously, it's not the hardest thing in the world to do, but is leveling up any less of a cop-out than using friendship? At least here, there's a good message that if you treat your Pokemon nicely, they sometimes survive. Wait, is that actually a good message? I don't really care. We have beaten Maylene, the gym leader I was most scared of that almost made me quit this run. And after Maylene, finally, we actually got a gym leader that genuinely wasn't too difficult in Crash or Wake. You see, right now, Bidoof has been a physical attacker, and it's been very good. But it can also make for a very good special attacker. Workup can also be purchased, and this is a good time as any to mention the horrendous decision that TMs are not infinite. Honestly, the worst change they made. I can't tell you how happy I was in Gen 5 when I no longer had to worry, oh, if I delete this move, I'll never get it back. And this would prove an issue in this run because Dig was one of the TMs that you only get a single time. As far as I'm aware, you cannot get Dig anywhere else. If this is possible, I wasn't aware of this information at the time. Based on the information I had, it was one location only. Because of that, I wasn't able to delete it. Thankfully, the rest of my moves I was because I could either use the Move Tutor, who's no longer free, but is in Selassian Town, which is where we're going to go to beat Crasher Wake, and other useful moves like Swords Dance, Workup, Thunderbolt, which we're going to use against Crasher Wake, those are all buyable. So... There is a bit of a decrease in quality of life, but at least there's so many good buyable TMs, at least from the perspective of a Bidoof runner. Anyway, Wake leads off with a Gyarados. Obviously, we have Bidoof out, and we're about to go for Thunderbolt. Unfortunately, even if we wanted to, physical attacks would be bad, because Intimidate does minus two. Gyarados goes for Crunch, and that still deals immense damage, despite how much higher in level we are. We don't one-shot with Thunderbolt, which isn't very good. Thankfully, because we knock it into a low enough range, Wake uses a Super Potion, heals the Gyarados, and we're able to knock it out with a Thunderbolt. That's really good. The next Pokemon that comes out is Quagsire, and from Gardenia, we have the Grass Knot TM, which will be quadruple super effective, 
and even without a single workup, we're able to knock out Quagsire, leaving one more Pokemon, Floatzel. Now, Floatzel is going to be fast, it's going to hit hard, not really sure how this is going to go, but, you know, just going to attack it with a Thunderbolt. It goes for Brine, which deals double damage and got a critical hit, but once again, power of friendship. However, I doubt this is going to knock it out. It does very good damage, but doesn't knock it out. Thankfully, we get a Paralysis, even with a Citrus Berry, so long as it doesn't have something like Aqua Jet or Quick Attack, we're actually going to win. It does have Aqua Jet, but once again, the power of friendship activates, and we knock it out. Oh, I don't know how I feel about this. I mean, like, Wake shouldn't be that difficult. There are ways I can do this so much better and not have to rely on luck. I mean, we already used the power of friendship. Yeah, I'm just going to reset. So I battled Wake again, but this time I remembered I had multiple Pluck TMs, so I could delete that for Work Up. And with Work Up, we're going to be able to one-shot everything. I also equipped myself with a Citrus Berry so that I wouldn't be below half HP for Brine, and thus should survive an attack, assuming Gyarados doesn't deal too much damage to me. Well, in the second battle, it didn't work out, and I won anyway due to, that's right, the power of friendship. The third time, however, while I did get a little lucky, it wasn't directly the power of friendship, and the most notable thing is I got to show off the fact that the Float Soul will use Ice Fang as opposed to Brine. It won't knock me out. And this at least proves we don't need crazy luck to beat Wake. Now, some of you might ask, if you're not going to use Double Team, why did you use the Affection mechanic? The truth is, I wasn't actually sure how it worked. And unlike Double Team, it's less intentional luck. Let me explain. With Double Team, especially since I have Simple, I can make so few moves hit me that I can just use that every single time to win, which is silly. I mean, especially if I save between battles, what's the challenge there? It's not fun. In the Smogon competitive battling format, moves like Double Team have been banned traditionally. So I want to respect that. With this stuff, it's a lot more, you have no idea what's going to happen. Is it against the spirit of my rules? Oh. I mean, we use the badge boost glitch, Gen 1 misses, critical hits. Pokemon's a game of luck. Adding one more random dice roll, to me, meh, not a big deal. To you, maybe. So you can do your own Badoof run, and I'll be happy not to watch it, because I'm going to be honest, this was painful. If it doesn't seem painful yet, don't you worry, we still have four more gyms, and oh yeah, the Elite Four to deal with. Not to mention, some other trainers that were even more difficult than them. So, hooray. That said, Fantina was not one of those trainers that were difficult. The only thing difficult about Fantina was trying to figure out the logic of having simple math problems in her gym. What? Someone told me in my Twitch chat it was because they wanted you to use the calculator app. Okay, that makes sense, but it still doesn't fit with Fantina's theme either of being a contest Pokemon trainer or a ghost type trainer. I, I don't know. It's stupid as heck. Anyway, her fight isn't that bad. She leads off with a Drift Blim, which, to be honest, could prove a little bit of a challenge with its combination of Strength Sap, as well as its Aftermath ability, which we've already talked about. If you use a physical move like Crunch, oh yeah, we have Crunch now, you will get a quarter of your health deducted after you knock out the Drift Blim. And that's kind of bad because Gengar comes out next, knows Sludge Bomb, and yeah, I didn't say easy, I said not so bad. Now, it took me a few times to actually get this all to work, but I felt this was a pretty decent strategy. So like I said, she leads off with Drift Blim, and we have a new moveset from Last You Saw Me. We're not going to use any special moves, despite Aftermath being a problem. Instead, it's going to go for Strength Sap, which does minus 2. I do Swords Dance, which does plus 4, so we're net plus 2. It goes for Strength Sap again, so I'm even in attack, and I go for Substitute. 
it's now probably going to go for Fly to try and break my Substitute. And that gives me a turn to set up a Swords Dance. So now we're plus four in attack. And we know Drift Blim is going to hit us. Thankfully, Drift Blim's attack is not that great. But the Substitute still faints. I was hoping I would survive it, but I, I don't. That's unfortunate because that was actually what my plan was. Since we're not going to be able to survive a Sludge Bomb... Of course, in this battle, Gengar doesn't go for Sludge Bomb. It instead goes for Confuse Ray. I'm not really certain why. This wasn't supposed to happen. I thought I was going to live a substitute. I mean, thankfully, we're able to not get hit because of the Confuse Ray and not hit ourselves. And so we've knocked out the Gengar. But out comes the Miss Magius, or Miss Magius, or Miss Magius, I actually don't know, nor care. Because what it is, is not powerful enough to knock me out with a Dazzling Gleam. Uh, my Citrus Berry activates, I don't need that. Because I'm going to hit it with a Crunch, and... Okay, I mean, different kind of luck there, I don't know why it went for Confuse Ray. That wasn't AI manipulation, the strategy was to survive a Fly with Substitute, and if I leveled up enough, that definitely would have happened. Whatever, I think you guys see what I was going for. Close enough. So that is five gym leaders down with Rourke's father, Byron. And his gym is certainly going to be interesting. But before we face him, we actually have to face the rival again. And by this point, the rival is starting to become a real problem. He now leads with a Staravia, which has Intimidate. So instantly I'm at minus to attack. And if that wasn't bad enough, it also knows double team. So while I'm trying to set up, it can set up and I might miss a lot. The next problem is Heracross. Now, in my first battle, I didn't have pluck, but I thankfully have two more TMs. I do need to be careful since once I use both those up, we'll have no more. And I'm going to have to fight the rival again, as well as Eren, both of whom have a Heracross so Pluck is super useful. In the end, just to make a long story short, I had to level up a little bit in order to withstand a few more attacks, as well as deal just a little bit more damage. So like I said earlier, Staravia does have Intimidate, so we're going to have to work around that. I opt to set up a Substitute after it used a double team. Now behind my Substitute, I can set up a Swords Dance, meaning I'm now plus two in attack. It went for Pluck, and this is where the level up came in handy, my substitute didn't fail. This is what I was trying to do against the Drift Blim earlier. Now with this current moveset, the only move I have that even affects Saravia is Pluck. I wish it was Aerial Ace, but thankfully we hit despite the increased evasion, and Saravia is knocked out. At this point, you're seeing why the substitute was so important. Heracross outspeeds and goes for Brick Break. Yes, through the power of friendship, maybe it would have missed or it would have survived on 1 HP. But here, we didn't need that, and we're able to easily knock out the Heracross, so that's two down. Now comes out Monferno, and thankfully Monferno only really has Power Up Punch or Mock Punch, both of which are 40 base power. So while it deals quite a bit of damage, it's not enough to knock me out, and since I was able to set up all those Swords Dance, I am able to knock out the Fighting-type Monferno with another Pluck. You'll also see that I equipped a Citrus Berry. It's not necessarily for the Rosilia, which can do a lot of damage. I thankfully got a Sweet Scent. I do believe at lower HP, the AI is more likely to attack you to finish you off. I do know that in other generations, it tends to prefer attacking. So that was one of the reasons. But the bigger reason was Buizel. It knows Brine, and at half HP, Brine's power is doubled, which would knock me out. So, instead of a very powerful attack, it deals not that much damage, and it looked fairly easy, but it took me about 40 minutes with battling the rival a bunch of times and leveling up, as well as using some irons in order to get all my stats what they needed to be for this fight. Yes, when it all works out, it looks easy, but there's a lot that goes into it. On that note, the next gym leader is the Steel-type gym leader, Byron. Now, Byron leads off with a Bronzor, which sucks, because otherwise we could just spam Dig. In fact, we also have Superpower. Neither of those moves are super effective against Bronzor. In fact, Dig won't even hit. Bronzor starts off with a Trick Room. 
This really stinks because if I knock out the Bronzor quickly, that means I'm going to go second, which would be bad. Plus, the Bronzor is good to set up against because its offensive stats are pretty awful. Having already gone for one Swords Dance, it goes for Confuse Ray. Like I said, only 25% chance I hit myself a Confusion, and I'm going to go for Stealth Rock. This is because Steelix has the Sturdy ability, which after Generation 5 means that if I were to one-shot, it would survive. Now, we don't want it to survive because it can deal a bunch of damage, so we need it to be knocked out in one hit, and Stealth Rock is a very easy way to do that. The Bronzor then goes for Darude, which is Sandstorm, and I go for Sword Dance since I'm going to need an attack boost if I want to one-shot these super bulky defensive Pokémon. I then get both very unlucky and very lucky at the same time. I accidentally hit Dig when I meant to use Super Power. Dig obviously will not hit Bronzor, but I hit myself in Confusion, so I have another chance. Unfortunately, because of the plus four in attack, I deal so much damage that my Iapa Berry? I don't know. Anyway, it activates when you're at 25% HP and restores your HP by a third. It used to be a lot better, to be honest, but still good enough. I am able to next turn get off the superpower, knock it out, and because of how long I took, the Trick Room is now done, and I'm going to be able to outspeed Byron's last two Pokemon. Now, I go for superpower here. There's two reasons. One, I need the extra attack, and two, Steelix knows Earthquake, and Earthquake can hit when you are underground for Dig, so we're just going to have to use it and then hope that we deal enough damage to knock out the Bastiodon. It is double weak to Superpower, so I think we should be good, but it's going to be close. Unfortunately, I messed up my PowerPoint management, and I don't actually have any more Superpowers, so I'm going to go for Dig and just hope for the best. Bastiodon goes for Stone Edge, which obviously will miss, and Moment of Truth. Okay, not bad, not bad at all. Was not actually a first try victory. We had some bad luck in a few fights versus Bronzor, and I'd forgotten Steelix had Sturdy, which is an issue, but didn't take too long at all. Very similar to Crash or Wake, in fact. Anyway, to this point, I started to take advantage of the Grand Underground. Now, at the time, I didn't really understand how it fully worked, and I still don't, but I did know a couple things. Number one, I knew Munchlax is there because I saw it, and I knew Munchlax always carried leftovers, which I really could use. The second thing we need in here are Heart Scales. Now, we have been used to, spoiled in fact, that the Move Relearner is available readily, and will teach you any move, egg move, or move you learn via level up for free. No longer the case. You need heart scales, there are two available in the game, one on Route 212, one on Route 214, but otherwise, you're going to need to go down into the underground and mine for heart scales, they're very small, they're hard to find. It's a lot of fun. With that heart scale, we now can challenge Candice. I had battled her before, but it went very poorly for reasons that will become apparent. I also, as future Jaros, want to apologize for the quality of my voice. I was really sick while recording and editing this video, but I really wanted to get out there because these games are new and I knew this run would be very exciting. Anyway, if you're curious why we needed that heart scale, we have Curse back, which is really helpful, and the leftovers will counteract Snow Warning, meaning I won't lose health every turn. Now, the strategy here is to go for two curses. Thankfully, I even outspeed after the first one. Actually, I don't think that mattered. But this will allow me to survive Metacham's attack. And in fact, Snover's Razorleaf did such little damage that you can see I thought about it, but decided to go for a third curse because why the heck not? It goes for Water Pulse, and that does more than Razorleaf did, but not a big deal. What is a big deal is on the very next turn, it goes for Razor Leaf and gets a critical hit. And I don't use Super Power, so I don't lose any defense for Metacham. But it was too little, too late. I had taken too much damage. And so the Metacham still, even with plus six defense, was able to knock out my puny Bidoof. In the end, it turned out that the sweet spot was in fact two curses. And once again, the winning strategy comes down to how the AI handles stat increases. You see, Metacham would go for a move that would knock me out, 
If it calculates one of its moves would do that in one hit, if not, there's a chance it goes for something like bulk up. Now, because of that, Crunch, which is not super effective, no longer deals enough damage to knock out the Metacham. Thankfully, it does do enough damage so that Metacham heals, and due to my high affection, aka power friendship, I get a critical hit and I'm able to knock it out. Next comes Sneasel, and Sneasel has terrible, terrible defenses. We just don't want to get damaged too much by it, but we're going to use Dig as opposed to Superpower, so we're going to have the maximum amount of defense for Abomasnow. And Abomasnow, here's the thing. If we have enough HP, it's going to go for Aurora Veil. The same thing Metacham does, it does. If it can't knock me out with Blizzard, which at my very high HP, it apparently won't, it's going to set up. And so, there are some recurring themes here with AI manipulation and power of friendship. Thus far, it's helped me get through seven gym leaders. Only one more to go. But what if I told you one of the most difficult sections in the game, the most difficult up to this point, was just on the horizon? Because... Although this is not something casually that's too difficult, we now have to complete the Team Galactic storyline, which eventually leads me to going up Mount Coronet, and then having to battle a tag team of Mars and Jupiter, only then, without an ability to save in between, needing to battle Cyrus. This was horrendous. And I'd like you to take a guess how long it took me to get past this part. And let me be clear what I mean. From the first time I battled Mars and Jupiter in the double battle till when I defeated Cyrus and was able to advance. For the record, if you beat Mars and Jupiter and lose to Cyrus, you need to re-defeat Mars and Jupiter again. And there's a lovely cutscene in between that is unskippable. Wonderful. To give you some context, this run has so far taken me 11 hours in real time, which we can use because we're not playing sped up. How long did these three or really two battles take me? Four and a half hours. And there's just everything about them sucks. What I've neglected to mention to this point is that the Mars Jupiter fight is not a double battle with you. There is one of those and I just used Turtwig and allowed it to faint because there's really nothing I can do about that. As you can see here, the rival joins in on the battle and the AI is even worse assisting you than it is trying to defeat you. Now, truth be told, I started to figure out strategies and I was able pretty consistently by like hour two to get past these guys every time. Where things started to go awry is Cyrus. You see, Cyrus leads with a Honchkrow. Not just any Honchkrow, a Honchkrow with the Super Luck ability with a Scope Lens. This is where the game really decides to be difficult and in a good way, this is genius. Super Luck increases your critical hit ratio, as does Scope Lens, and Cyrus uses moves that increase your critical hit ratio further. From generation, I believe, 6 onward, this combination leads to 100% critical hits. And the downside for me is I can't simply use Curse or something in order to mitigate the damage dealt. I either need to outspeed Honchkrow and one-shot it, or take a bunch of damage. At my current level, while I was able to outspeed, Honchkrow is pretty slow. It was barely a 2 a KO. In fact, sometimes it wasn't. And even when I got past Honchkrow, we weren't done. Next came Gyarados. Gyarados would use Intimidate, and Thunderbolt can't win a KO because Gyarados also has a super great item. The Wakan, 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 I have no idea how to pronounce that. The Electric Reducing Berry, which for one attack decreases the damage dealt by an electric attack by half. That is super great. And for the record, I'm super happy that trainers are finally starting to get good movesets and good items. I just wish I could save between this very tedious double battle 
and this battle that, yeah, Gyarados absolutely destroys me. And so the solution was level up. It, it really was. There's nothing more I could do. And that's what took me so long. I spent the first hour and a bit trying to brute force this, but even with AI manipulation and the power of friendship, I wasn't making any progress. Now, like I said, leveling up is pretty bad, but there are a bunch of rare candies lying around that I hadn't picked up yet. So now's the perfect time to do that. And in addition, we can go to the Grand Underground. And since the level scales as you get further into the game, even though they're wild Pokemon, you actually do get a lot of levels battling them. Plus, I didn't know this at the time, there actually is a lucky egg located in one of the rooms. And contrary to what I thought, the items aren't actually random. This is exactly why I've never done one of these challenges blind before, but hey, there is a certain degree of excitement trying to figure out all these things in a brand new game. Anyway, this is what took me so darn long. I'm going to rebattle Mars and Jupiter, and Peanut Butter has gotten all the way to almost a very nice level at level 68. I've opted to go with Curse, Superpower, Dig, and Thunderbolt. I did a lot of experimenting, and this was the best. Not necessarily for these guys, but for Cyrus going forward. The thing about these Bronzor that absolutely stunk is that they like to use Reflect and Light Screen, and ideally the strategy whenever you have a double battle is this knock out one of the trainer's three Pokemon first and turn it into a two-on-one. Right now, it feels like it's a one-on-two since the Munchlax just seems to do things at random. If I could teach TMs between battles and if Curse were a TM, I would love to use Work Up here because it would make the Golbats a lot faster. Thankfully, they're usually not too bad. The biggest thing that can happen is confusion or Golbat using Poison Fang and getting badly poisoned, which can knock you out. Other than that, really the Poison Fang is the big one. You are going to win by either using Thunderbolts or Dig. And in some cases, if you really need to use Superpower, but realistically, I have that more for Cyrus than I do for this battle. And by this point, I was pretty much getting through these trainers every single time. Now I've got to sit back and watch this same cutscene with Palkia. Yes, I'm playing Pearl version. But thankfully, due to the power of editing, and boy, is this going to take forever to edit, we have made it back to Cyrus. Now, for whatever reason, Honchkrow tended to use Defog turn 1 a lot, so I didn't level up to the point where I would one-shot. I do a lot of damage, but I don't one-shot, and thankfully it goes for Defog. Air Cutter has like a 5% chance of missing, but I really don't get why it even has that move. Just as I praise the game for good movesets, that one kind of confuses me, but whatever. It's worked out in our favor, and we've gone through the Honchkrow without taking a single hit point of damage. The big question was whether I would one-shot the Gyarados or not. Or so you'd think. The more important thing is that we outsped the Gyarados, because even with a critical hit, and yes, that was a critical hit, we do not one-shot Gyarados because of that darn berry. Thankfully, because of our level increase and the fact we go first, we are hit only a single time with Waterfall, giving us plenty of HP remaining for the final two Pokemon. And Weavile sucks, but in a good way, as in Cyrus's moves are terrible. Its best move, other than Fling, which can only be used once, is Dig. And Dig as we know, is a two-turn attack, meaning I'm able to set up a curse. And because Dig isn't same type after that curse, we deal a metric ton of damage and can knock it out with a superpower. With Lefty's recovery, we're at almost 130 HP for the final Pokemon, Crobat. Now, Crobat has some okay moves, but I'm just going to go for Thunderbolt. It goes for Cross Poison, does a decent amount of damage. Thankfully, Thunderbolt is doing about half. If I don't get a critical hit against me, I should win. Cyrus, you can look angry all you want. It is possible that you're going to lose, and it's about to happen because no critical hit. I'm able to knock it out. I don't even think a critical hit would have knocked me out anyway. Doesn't matter. Oh. My. God. 
<sighs> Thankfully, this is the only battle that's going to take this long. Epic foreshadowing. But before we talk about the battle that, yes, took longer than four hours, we get a little reprieve in that we get to battle Volkner, the electric gym leader in Sunny Shore City. I battled him a few times and started to figure out what he was trying to do to me, so I came up with this strategy. He's going to lead off with Raichu, and Raichu almost always is going to go for Volt Switch. This is annoying, but not the end of the world. So you see, I have a totally different moveset now, and I'm going to go for Curse right off the bat. I also have my leftovers equipped to try and gain back HP, which will be where Protect comes into play, you'll see. Ambipalm comes out, and here it's going to go for Fake Out, it always does, with Technician that deals a ton of damage, but with Protect, I don't need to worry about that. So that's pretty good. Now, since I have a Curse up, I'm able to set up a Substitute, and it goes for Double Hit. Thankfully, I get a miss due to the power of Friendship, and I'm now behind the Substitute. As you're about to see, Double Hit doesn't do all that much damage, even with the Technician Boost. So I'm going to go for another Protect in order to gain just a little bit of HP back. As I would figure out, HP is kind of important in this battle, so we need as much as possible. Now remember how I said I'm not too concerned about Double Hit missing? Well, you'll see why. It goes for Double Hit, and even with the Technician same type boost, with my Curse up, it doesn't even take out my Substitute. To make matters even worse for Volkner, I have gone for a second Curse, and now I'm going to go for Protect, just to gain a little bit more HP back. You can see Ambipom has gone for Thunderbolt, because that now is going to deal more damage, and so I know it's time to go for Dig. Ambipom has Last Resort, which can only be used after it uses all its previous moves, so that knocks out my Substitute, but it's not a big deal. With the plus 4, I am able to one-shot with Dig, Dig also being a two-turn attack allows me to gain even more HP back, and I'm almost full for the Raichu. So Raichu is probably going to once again go for the Volt Switch, so I'm going to go for Protect just to gain a little bit more HP back. And now I'm going to go for Dig, and it's probably going to go into Octillery. That typically is what comes out here. As far as I'm aware, the order the Pokemon come out in are consistent every time. The only game I know that doesn't really do that is Gold and Silver, which is why I don't like to run those for challenges. Anyway, back to the battle at hand. Octillery is going to go for Focus Energy, which is actually useful, but Dig just deals way too much damage. I'm not really sure why Volkner has an Octillery. I mean, it is a good Pokemon to have for ground types, but it doesn't really fit with the whole electric theme. Whatever. Raichu has now come out again, and once again, you know the drill, we go for Protect, it goes for Volt Switch, and we're going to use one more Dig. But before we do, note how much Volt Switch is doing. It's a ton. I think you can see why I'm so adamant that I have a ton of HP, especially when you consider the Pokemon coming out now is Luxray. Luxray has Intimidate, so we've lost two of our plus four in attack. Now, because of Dig, we're going to get a miss, and some lefties, and then a hit, and I don't know if we have enough to tank this last Volt Switch. I think it's going to be close-ish, but I should be fine. Moment of truth, we're good. Okay, very, very, very good, and Raichu's defense is abysmal. So that is eight gym battles. It has taken me a very, very, very long time. And unfortunately, we're not done. There are still six more battles to go. One more battle with the rival, the Elite Four, and of course, Cynthia, known as the most difficult champion in Pokemon history. Wouldn't you know though, once again, it's the battle I least expected that ended up taking me forever. And that is the battle against the final rival. Why did this battle take me so long? Well, let's talk about what he uses. He starts off with a Staraptor, meaning I'm instantly going to get minus two in attack. That sucks. It also has U-Turn, meaning it might come back, which is another minus two. But it knows close combat, 
and when it U-turns, it goes into Infernape, which also knows close combat, and oh yeah, there's a Heracross, which can also one-shot me with a fighting move. Three fighting-type Pokémon on this team. And Bidoof, for all the moves it does get, does not have a way to increase its speed. And what I realized was I just need to outspeed the first Staraptor, knock it out and we should be good, right? Well, wrong. If we look at this on Bulbapedia, as I'd figure out, it's got a Focus Sash. Meaning, I have to figure out a way to knock it out in two hits, and have enough HP and or speed to make it past Infernape. Well, I'm going to tell you, at my current level, I couldn't even get past Infernape. I don't care how much power of friendship we have on our side, it was not happening. And so, I actually did receive a little bit of help in the form of information. I found out what the stats are on this Staraptor. Knowing that information, I can do damage calculations or speed calculations and figure out exactly what I need to train, what I need to do, what's going to work. I should also note resetting in this game takes like 35 seconds, which doesn't seem bad until you lose a fight again and again and again and again and again, and every reset is excruciating. If you don't reset, you lose some friendship, which we need for, you know, the power of friendship. I've been mentioning it a bunch. So yeah, very, very tedious. Unfortunately, this Staraptor has a lot of investment in speed, decent IVs, and a plus nature, meaning I had to level up a ton, and I had used up all the rare candies. So I had to go to the Grand Underground and just battle wild Pokemon a lot. Also, by the way, even when I'd maxed out my speed EVs, I still wasn't fast enough without more leveling up. I needed to go all the way to level 87. So now finally, after over five hours of preparation, I'm finally able to do this battle, so I think. Who knows how it's actually going to go. Like before, Intimidate hits, that's a minus two right away. We're going to make that up with Curse, and that's going to give us a plus two in defense. Close Combat thankfully doesn't crit, and with that Curse only deals 80 damage, with lefties even less. Now, I'm going to use Protect for the same reason we saw versus Volkner. HP is very valuable, I need as much as possible. It protected on my U-turn, and I'm going to set up a Curse. Of course, it goes for Close Combat, it now outspeeds me since Curse lowers your speed, and we're going to have to use Protect again because we're running pretty low on HP. Now the good news is Close Combat only has 5 Power Points, and at this point, I think Staraptor has almost run out. Thankfully, I get a Clutch Power of Friendship miss, and I'm pretty sure that's it for Close Combat. Thus, I anticipated it going for U-Turn, which it did, going into Infernape, which I need to knock out in a single hit. I go for Pluck, and we do knock out the Infernape in a single hit. That is a huge Pokemon to knock out. It never got the chance to attack me. That was something this whole strategy was trying to do. Now, unfortunately, Staraptor comes back out. That's going to lower my attack. Thankfully, my defense boosts are still there. I'm going to go for another curse, and I was wrong. There was one more close combat. This should be the last one. And with my curse, I have a little bit more attack now, which is pretty good. My defense has already been maxed. I'm going to use Protect, and it goes for U-Turn. I think that's all it can do right now. So once again, I'm going to go for Pluck and probably knock out whatever comes out next. But shockingly, it goes for Steel Wing rather than U-Turn. That's great because, as we've discussed, it has a Focus Sash, meaning it's a two-turn hit anyway. And I'd love it not to use Intimidate anymore, meaning I don't want U-Turn. So I'm going to go for another Protect. It goes for Steel Wing once again. Hopefully it goes for Steel Wing a third time and we can knock it out and keep our pretty formidable attack. That doesn't happen. It both goes for U-Turn and gets a critical hit. That's brutal. But at the very least, we're going to get Snorlax, which unfortunately we will no longer outspeed due to the curse, and we don't knock out with Pluck. We're going to have to withstand a Hammer Arm, which Snorlax knows, 
and I'm nervous about that, so I went for Protect. 124 HP. Will we survive? It goes for Yawn. Now, I went for Dig because it deals a little bit more damage, and we get to recover a little bit more HP, but I wasn't expecting Yawn. We knock it out with Dig, but now I'm going to be asleep. That's... that's pretty bad. I actually would have rather the Hammer Arm. Floatzel has Brine still, so I'm asleep, and Floatzel uses Brine, and I'm asleep. Lovely. Okay, well, I can just, I try for Protect here, but I'm still asleep. Floatzel uses Brine, and now I am at exactly half HP, meaning I need to wake up and use Protect, or Brine's gonna deal a ton of damage. Thank goodness. Wow, that was... That was pretty fortuitous. Okay, let's gain a little bit of HP back. We're going to go for Dig. This should one-shot, and we'll gain some back as we're underground. Floatzel's Quick Claw, no concern of mine because I'm really slow, and we have more than enough attack to knock out the level 49 Floatzel, and there's only a couple Pokemon left. Heracross is one of them, and this is another one I'm very nervous about. I'm going to go for Protect because it has Rock Slide. Does it not know a fighting move? Did I worry about this thing for nothing? Seems like that's the case. It went for Rock Slide again. Sounds like the information I got on the moves was incorrect or I was looking at the wrong sheet. I was certain it had a fighting move like Brick Break. Apparently it doesn't. I'll take it. Now, the final Pokemon, other than the Staraptor on 1 HP, is the Rose Raid. It goes for Grassy Terrain. I was really nervous about a Giga Drain, but Grassy Terrain, that's going to gain even more HP back for my Bidoof. I think we did it. It has taken me over 5 hours and 20 minutes of leveling up, planning, and hoping. But truth be told, on the first battle where I actually outsped the Staraptor with the moves I'd planned, it looks like, barring something ridiculous, we are going to defeat the rival and make it to the Elite Four. Will this happen? Yes. It goes for Pluck. I go for Pluck. And mine deals less damage, actually, but enough to knock it out. Okay. Don't get too excited. We have four more trainers to go and the champion. And for those of you who watch my solo runs, you might know that I have a rule not to save in between Elite Four members. We are not going to be doing that, by which I mean we are definitely going to be saving. That means any moves I need, anything I need, needs to be in my bag. I was very certain, because once I save and start deleting my moves, I am locked in and there's nothing more I can do. Thus, I need to be certain that I didn't need any more move tutoring moves, and that all the TMs I needed I had, that's also the reason I'm using Dig and Pluck. I need those moves for Elite Four members. Pluck will be useful against Eren. Now, Eren also has a Heracross, which I'm sure this time does have a fighting move, and he also has a Dust Tox. This Dust Tox is super freaking annoying, because, as the name suggests, or at least the second half, it knows Toxic. I'm gonna set up a curse, there's Toxic. That's not good. Because, unlike Poison, that's going to gradually increase, and since I typically like to have longer battles and stall things out so I can set up, that's not going to work, so I just have to go for a Pluck, knock out the Dust Tox, and now I have to hope not only that I win quickly enough for Toxic not to knock me out, but that one curse is all I need for the rest of the battle. Now here is a moment of truth. Heracross, do we outspeed? No. Brick Break does over half my HP. I go for Pluck, and there goes Heracross. So that's really good. Now, the next Pokemon that's going to come out is a Beautifly. And already, I'm hemorrhaging HP due to Toxic. Also, that Brick Break didn't help. And Bug Buzz is going to finish me off. Well, that felt like a pretty good warm-up. I think I have an idea what he's going to do. And I think I can defeat him. Let's try this once again. 
So I'd like Dustox not to use Toxic. I'm going to go for Pluck right away, try to knock it out. Dustox is fairly bulky and Pluck is only base 60 power, but it goes for Light Screen. With the Black Sludge, I'm not sure Pluck is going to knock it out. It does. Okay, so now I'm not poisoned. That's clutch. And I don't have any special moves, so Light Screen completely, completely useless. Now I will outspeed the Heracross. The question is, will I one-shot with Pluck? I don't actually outspeed the Heracross. Okay. Power of Friendship saved me there with that Brick Break miss. And this is not looking like the strategy I'm going to want to use going forward. I am thankfully able to knock out the Heracross in a single hit. And next out comes Beautifly. Now, I don't think... Oh, I do outspeed the Beautifly. And I went for Curse. It went for Quiver Dance. That's not good. A Bug Buzz will knock me out. Hopefully, it does it again. That's awesome. And I'm able to go for a Pluck. Knock it out. And now here comes Vespaquin. It doesn't have pressure. That's good for my power points. It is fairly bulky. I'm just going to go for Pluck. It's so slow that I outspeed, but I don't knock it out. It goes for attack order. Thankfully, it doesn't crit. It has a higher critical hit chance. And I'm just going to knock it out. Oh, maybe not. It goes for a full restore. That's actually okay because that really doesn't make a difference. Since I'm faster, all it did was waste a little bit of my time. And that leaves us with one final Pokemon, a non-bug Pokemon, Drapion. It goes for Cross Poison. Of course it gets a critical hit, but that shouldn't matter because I think we're going to one-shot the Drapion. It all comes down to this. Do we have enough attack? We do. Okay. I'm going to be honest, that went way better than I expected. Hopefully the rest of Elite Four goes as well, but I'm not going to count on it. But now we have a trainer who likes to use Pokemon that live in the Eartha. Please give a warm welcome to Elite Four trainer, Bertha. Bertha, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So aside from teaching Grass Knot for Pluck, which we no longer need, I've kept my moveset the same. I'm going to use Grass Knot on Quagsire since it does four times damage. And we get a crit, which is both good and bad. It's good because we knock it out. It's bad because I don't know if we needed that crit to knock it out. Okay, now we got Pseudo Wudo. I use Grass Knot and it does about half. So Work Up would be very helpful here for more damage. It goes for Head Smash and wow, okay. I like how quickly the HP moves, by the way. Big improvement from Diamond and Pearl. Anyway, yeah, I'm going to not knock it out. It's going to go for Head Smash, and uh, I'm going to have to go back to the drawing board here. Now, the second time around, I do have Work Up because, well, let's face it, it'll be super helpful. Unfortunately, Quagsire also knows Toxic. Hooray. Now, I might need Curse later on, so I don't even know if I should continue if I win, but I just want to see how Work Up works. Obviously, with a plus two in Special Attack, I'm going to one-shot Quagsire. I'm not sure if one workup will be enough to knock out Pseudo Wudo. Considering what happened last time, it might be close. Thankfully, at least in this battle, we do knock out the Pseudo Wudo in one hit. That is two down. And one of our other Pokemon, potentially the next one, is a Whiskash. Whiskash is also water ground. So that should be very, very weak to Grass Knot. I mean, it is, right? Well, here's the problem. Remember Gyarados? And the berry, yeah, we got another one of those. The Rindo Berry. It goes for Bulldoze, which will sharply decrease my speed. And with that toxic damage racking up, I can already tell this is going to be... Yeah, okay, well, Belch, critical hit. Beautiful. I actually survived due to the power of friendship, but that is a very temporary survival. The toxic will, in fact, knock me out. You do have a slight chance of shaking off things like that due to friendship. Friendship is so overpowered. But even if that happens, we're going to be knocked out. It doesn't actually. So what are we going to do? I battled Bertha a few more times, trying to learn a little bit more and come up with a strategy. And thus far, the Quagsire is toxic and Whiskash can actually use Hydro Pump. Between the two of them, I'm not making it past. Theoretically, if I set up three workups, I might one-shot Whiskash, but it's hard to know if that's going to happen. 
and it's hard to set up a bunch of workups or anything when Quagsire can use Toxic, and if I don't get the lucky shake off, I lose. Well, after being hit with Toxic, I figured now's as good a time as any to figure out whether three workups will knock out the Whiskash. Thankfully, I'm able to shake off the Toxic, and I think about it, you can see me hesitate, but I decide not to be greedy and to just knock out the Quagsire right there and then. We've lost quite a bit of HP. We will be able to knock out Sudowoodo, but I do not believe we have enough power to knock out the Whiskash, at least not with that Rindo Berry. Sudowoodo is absolutely no problem, and our leftovers are slowly restoring our HP, but unfortunately, even if we do manage to knock out Whiskash, it's going to be all for naught if we aren't able to knock out the next two Pokemon because we're at too low HP. I decide to be a little creative and to go for Dig. We have raised our attack stat quite a bit, so Dig is going to deal quite a bit of damage, and it in fact almost one-shots the Whiskash. That's interesting. Thankfully, Bulldoze, unlike Earthquake, doesn't hit underground, and Bertha restores HP, but I'm hoping it's going to be a range. It doesn't look like it. It looks like I need a little bit more attack to one-shot, but since I'm not using Curse, I actually can just keep attacking, even if she keeps using full restores. And with two workups, even with the Rindo Berry, Whiskash is taken into Red Bar. That's very interesting and something I should keep note of, assuming I lose. Belch still does a ton of damage and I decide to go for Dig, just like with Volkner to gain just a little bit more HP back. We don't have Protect because, well, if I could use five moves I would, but for the first time we're able to knock out Whiskash and we're almost leveling up. And just as we started to feel good about things knocking out that Whiskash, I go for Dig. But Golem actually outspeeds due to that Bulldoze, and yeah, I'm absolutely destroyed without any defense boosts. Hooray! It was at this point I had a bit of a Eureka moment, where I realized I'd been looking at this battle all wrong. Yes, they're all defensively bulky, and yes, Grass Knot does do times 4 against most of her Pokemon. However, it's not working. And Toxic is a big reason why. And there's a really easy way to mitigate that. And that's Substitute. And while I'm behind a Substitute, if I have high enough defense, it might last quite a long time. And we have a move that raises our defense. And as I mentioned a short time ago, deleting Curse is always going to be risky because it isn't a TM move and I can't teach it back. So if I were to need it later, I'd be out of luck. So let's try using physical attacks and seeing how that works. First things first, let's avoid Toxic by going for Substitute, and there's Toxic. Very, very, very good. I'm very happy about this. Now, we're going to go for Curse, and I don't know what Quagsire is going to do. It goes for Earthquake. The Substitute may hold? It does. That is huge. I have Crunch. I'm going to go for it just to see how much damage it does. It lowers Quagsire's defense. This is really good. It goes for Surf, and obviously it's going to knock out my Substitute. But, a couple things to note. We are still outspeeding the Quagsire. And I think about it, I worry about another Toxic. So I'm going to go for Substitute. And Quagsire does indeed go for Toxic. These are definitely some good predictions, but in no way is this battle over yet. I'm going to go for one more Curse. This should make me slower than Quagsire. And it goes for Surf, which I avoid due to friendship. Okay, so we've gone a little bit of luck. Plus, we got luck earlier where Crunch lowered defense. Surf doesn't actually knock out my substitute. I'm so perplexed. Anyway, because we have no Grass Knot, we have to use Dig. It goes for Head Smash. But we should, by the time we hit Sudowoodo, be at full health. And we are. Well, basically, minus two. That's nothing. Now we have Whiskash, and as we saw, we're going to come pretty close to knocking it out with two curses. So I'm going to go for Crunch. It goes for Hydro Pump and absolutely just deals a ton of damage. But somehow, even with just two curses, I'm able to knock it out in a single Crunch. I was hoping for a Defense Drop or a Crit or something. But as it turns out, it's just an unfavorable range that I wasn't hitting before. I'll take it. 
Now we have Golem, and I need to be smart here. While Dig would be good, it is going for Earthquake here, and I'm able to avoid it. I go for Crunch. Obviously, it's not going to one-shot, but it has Sturdy anyway, so it's not a big deal. It goes for Earthquake and does quite a bit of damage considering I'm plus four in defense, but I'm able to tank it, and now it all comes down to Bertha's final Pokemon, Hippowdon. And... I'm kind of scared. I, I don't really know what this thing is going to do to me. And if I get hit by Earthquake underground, which it knows, that would be bad. What do I do? I'm going to go for Crunch. It goes for Earthquake. And uh, yeah, I think this battle is over. It's not going to one shot. Unfortunately, we came oh so close, but we got hit a few too many times. And so we're going to lose to Bertha unless we get some insane luck via friendship, and we do. Okay, good enough for me. <laughs> Yay, friendship. This is the anime version of Pokemon, where you don't actually have to be better than your opponent. Your Pokemon just have to like you enough by following you around. All right, now we're going to go and battle Flint. The Fire Trainer. You know, the guy who notoriously only has two Fire Pokemon. Something that was a big meme and fixed in Platinum, but we're not doing Platinum, so he can only have two Fire Pokemon again. Yeah, that guy. Well, hopefully he's challenging, because otherwise it's just a very strange decision with zero payoff. He leads off with Rapidash, one of the two Fire Pokemon he actually has. Anyway, I'm just going to go for Curse, and it knows Hypnosis? I didn't even know Rapidash could learn that. But, okay, that's a thing, I guess. I'm going to go for Substitute, and that is now the second time Hypnosis has missed us. I'm not sure if it's just missing, or it's the power of friendship. There's a 40% chance. Who cares? I'm set up behind a Substitute now, and might as well go for another Curse. It goes for Iron Tail? Okay... And it doesn't knock out my substitute, meaning I'm probably going to be able to set up another curse. And I do that after it hits me with another Iron Tail. Knocks out my substitute, but I'm at plus four in attack and defense. And if this hypnosis doesn't hit me, I might be able to sweep. I'm going to set up another substitute. It goes for Iron Tail. Unfortunately, there is a chance for Iron Tail to lower defense. And that's exactly what happens. But... Thankfully, the next Iron Tail misses, I opt to not set up any more curses and just try to see if I can sweep the entire team. With the substitute up, it should be possible. And after one dig, I mean the critical hit didn't matter, we're 20% of the way there. The next Pokemon Flint is going to send out is his trusty Lopunny. You know, a fire type Pokemon. I I'll stop, I promise. Anyway, it goes for high jump kick. It doesn't even knock out the substitute. Worse yet, when I'm underground, it goes for the high jump kick again. Why? All right, I, I just, I don't understand. Well, now we get a Steelix. Another, well, okay, I said I'd stop. I'm going to go for dig. It goes for iron tail. This should destroy my substitute, and it does. And I'm not sure if this is a rock head Steelix. Or a sturdy Steelix. I guess we'll find out in just a second. After I use Dig. And it is in fact not sturdy. Because it didn't survive. We have Infernape. Which is actually kind of scary. And one more non-fire Pokemon. Driftblimp. Which is what's going to come out right now. I still have Crunch. I knew he has a Driftblimp. I'm going to set up Substitute. Just in case it goes for like Will-O-Wisp. Went for Minimize. Not ideal. However, there is a second reason this is kind of useful. Now, Infernape can't one-shot me. To further that cause, I'm going to use one more Curse. That's going to raise my defense back to plus six. So we are super, super bulky. Now we just have to hit. It's going to go for Baton. Uh-oh. 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 Crunch hits Infernape, but it's not very effective, so it doesn't knock it out. Its defense drops, but that's not really going to matter. Uh, this is bad. It goes for close combat. I don't care that I'm at plus three. That's going to knock out my substitute. 
I go for Dig at the very least. This is going to gain me a little bit of HP back. We're almost at full, but I need to hit. Close combat misses. Dig hits. Phew. And that's the battle because, as I'd find out, Driftblim does not actually have an attacking move. Meaning, as long as we eventually hit it, we will win. And Flint, an Elite Four member, is my first ever impossible challenge, as far as I can remember. First try victory. Man, Flint sucks. That leaves me with just two trainers to go. One of them is Lucian. And Lucian's a little scary, because his Pokémon are typically going to be special attackers, and although I have Crunch, I'm not going to be able to set up defensively like I have for the previous three members. He leads with Mr. Mime, and I'm very concerned since Mr. Mime is now part Fairy type, and thus it's not super effective when I use Crunch. I'm going to go for Curse anyway just to boost my attack, and I'm very surprised I outsped the Mr. Mime. It goes for Reflect. That is literally the worst case scenario. It then goes for Psychic, and that deals 100 damage. That's a lot. So, I'm just gonna go for Dig. It goes for Light Screen. This thing has Light Clay, so that means 8 turns of Reflect, 8 turns of Light Screen. Beautiful. Well, I hit with Dig, and it does about half. With Reflect, that's pretty good, so I know how much damage I need to deal if there were no Reflect up. I am going to be able to knock out the Mr. Mime, but that Psychic lowers my special defense, and I don't even bother. We're just going to reset and try again. And although that battle may have seemed like a waste, it actually gave me the key piece of information I felt would lead to a brand new strategy. We don't need Substitute, and we outspeed Mr. Mime. Why not use Sword Stance? We only have to set up one, and it's plus four in attack. We already know that would one-shot Mr. Mime, assuming it doesn't use Reflect. So I'm going to hope it doesn't do that. Unfortunately, I get Reflect. Of course I do. So I'm going to set up another Swords Dance. I now have four times attack. It goes for Psychic. Now, since I want to stall out these screens, I'm going to go for Dig. And that is also going to do the added benefit of gaining me a little bit more HP back. As you'd expect, Dig does not knock out Mr. Mime because of the Reflect. But it goes for Light Screen, meaning we'll have a lot of HP for the remaining four Pokemon. This fight could have gone better, theoretically, but realistically, I'm all set up, Reflect is running out soon, and it didn't damage me too, too much. This is pretty good. Now, the next Pokémon we have to face is a bit of a scary one. It's a Metachamp, a Fighting-type Pokémon. But if we outspeed, it could be really good, because I'm gonna go for Dig, and yeah. Ah. <laughs> uh... I can understand how it didn't predict I would use Dig, but that's that's pretty funny. And even with Reflect, we're going to knock out the Metacham at half HP. For those of you who don't know, if High Jump Kick misses, you lose half of your total HP. So that was pretty good. Now Reflect has worn off, and we get to face the evolved form of my favorite Pokemon, Alakazam. I'm going to go for Crunch. It goes for Nasty Plot. Beautiful. I was very worried about Alakazam. Not so worried if it doesn't attack me. And that just leaves two Pokemon left, including Big Rig's Giraffe Rig over here. I'm gonna go for Crunch and I outspeed the Giraffe Rig. Okay! I think we won, guys, because the last Pokemon is a Bronzong, and Steel no longer resists Dark, so Crunch is going to be super effective, and with plus six in attack, well, let's just... Yeah. Okay, that was pretty much exactly what anyone could have expected. Not too bad. And all the momentum we just established gonna come crashing down. Because we have to face Cynthia. Cynthia's team is outstanding. From Spiritomb to Garchomp to Milotic, there are so many Pokemon I'm terrified of. And while I wouldn't call Spiritomb easy per se, once I knock it out, it gets way, way worse because she's going to send out a Pokemon that you all remember, Lucario. And if you thought Maylene's Lucario was difficult, well, this one is a special attacker. I didn't know what to do. 
there's nothing I can do. The power of friendship will barely help me out because Aurasphere can't miss. I can't boost my special defense. What in the world am I going to do? How am I going to get past this Lucario? I would try moveset after moveset. I'm stuck. I've saved between every member. I can't leave. If I could, I would learn Amnesia because, well, that would help out tremendously against a lot of Cynthia's team. But imagine having Amnesia for all those other battles. It would have been completely useless. So I couldn't have Amnesia. I tried Substitute, Protect, Swords Dance, Curse, Workup. Nothing was working. I tried everything, but at the end of the day, we have a Pokemon that cannot miss with a move that one-shots me from full health that I cannot in any way defend. It, it, was, it was looking dire. It was looking dire. And even if I somehow survived on one health due to friendship, the rest of her team would have obliterated me. So how in the world could I possibly win? Is this indeed going to be my first actually impossible run since my very first Magikarp in red and blue? Is this all Bidoof can do? Get to Cynthia and then lose to Lucario? And you want to know something even better, because this is truly upsetting, is that even if I'm able to somehow get a dig against Lucario without raising my attack, even a critical hit is not a one hit KO. But wait a minute, let's rewind for a second. How was I able to get an attack off against Lucario? We haven't before. Well, here is where I accidentally discovered the key to defeating Cynthia. Ice Beam. No, I didn't freeze Spirit Tomb, but for whatever reason, when I used Ice Beam, she swapped into Lucario, and this was consistent. So it seemed like so long as I could swap with an attack boost, I would potentially be able to get a free attack on Lucario and knock it out. Well, as I was experimenting with the strategy, it had yet to actually work. And that got me thinking, wait a minute. If Spiritomb's frozen for a few turns, we could set up a bunch of stuff. Substitute, work up, swords dance. And if we set up enough, we might be able to do the exact same thing we've done to Flint and just sweep through her team, maybe. We're not going to outspeed, but if we can just get through the tricky Pokemon behind a substitute, maybe it's going to be possible. Unfortunately, that means relying on a 10% freeze chance and a 25% chance thereafter it doesn't thaw. Of course, this extremely luck-based strategy was far easier said than done. But finally, after about half an hour of trying, I was able to get the freeze I wanted. I was able to set up all my workups and my substitute, and I was able to knock out the spirit tomb. And then something crazy happened. Lucario used nasty plot. I believe what's going on here is that because this time I'm at full HP, Cynthia wants to power up so that Aurasphere will definitely one hit KO me. This means not only is my substitute going to be around for Lucario, but I'm actually going to have the substitute for her remaining Pokemon, including this Gastrodon. Now, this is a defensively bulky Gastrodon, so I'm not expecting to one-shot it with Dig, but it goes for Rock Tomb. It does not knock out my substitute. Even though I have no curses, we're using Workup. And it doesn't lower my speed because I'm behind the substitute. And thanks to the amount of damage Dig did, we're able to knock out the Gastrodon in two. And three Pokemon in, we are at full HP, we have max attack and special attack, and we are behind a substitute. Finally, Cynthia is able to break the substitute with Rose Raid going for Sludge Bomb, but we are able to counter with an Ice Beam, and there was just the Garchomp and the Milotic left. Now, as we've seen, the premier Pokemon will come out last, so we're going to face Milotic here, and Milotic is a nightmare. Scald. Recover. This is a defensively bulky Pokemon that has a Flame Orb with the Marvel Scale ability. 
this is not gonna go well for me at all. I was very nervous, you can see. I paused on here for a while, thinking exactly how I want to tackle it. I don't have many options. I have Ice Beam, and I have Dig. I kind of just have to use one of them. Unfortunately, I have no choice but to go for Dig, and since it's a two-turn attack, that means the Milotic's gonna get burned by its Flame Orb and get the Marvel Scale boost in defense. And I don't think this is gonna work. I've used up too many of my power points that unless I get a critical hit, I'm probably gonna run out of digs before the Milotic runs out of HP. The Flame Orb is helping me out, being like a reverse leftovers, but unfortunately Cynthia is cleverly recovering, and since Dig is a two-turn attack, she has twice the opportunities to use Recover, while Ice Beam just isn't gonna deal enough damage. Milotic is a better special defensive Pokemon, typically. Furthermore, if one of the Scalds ends up hitting, I'm done. So at this point, I'm pretty much relying on a crit, a crit I'm not getting. But the worst part of this whole thing is that just when it looks like I'm about to win, Cynthia uses a full restore. Oh my god, that was painful. I don't think there's any way to win without a critical hit at this point. We only have two power points left of Dig, and she has more ability to stall me out then I have the ability to stall her out. It's all come down to this. We need Dig to be a critical hit. And unfortunately, it isn't. We've run out of power points. We have to use Ice Beam. And we don't even have a chance to freeze. Even a critical hit is barely going to be doing anything to this Milotic. I think we're done. We worked so hard. It's like 5 in the morning when I was recording this footage. Everyone was watching on Twitch, and they all had to see me just totally devastated. Because after all that, it didn't work. It just didn't work. I didn't have enough power points. I didn't deal enough damage. I don't know what to do. That seems like the only strategy that I even has a hope of working. I don't even know how I'm going to get past Lucario without the strategy we just used. And we couldn't get past the Milotic. If we had crunched, that'd be great, but what are we going to give up? Without workup, I can't raise both my special and physical attack, and we're going to need a powerful Ice Beam to knock out Garchomp, which also has one of those berries. So, hooray. Without Substitute, well, we're not going to be able to set up against the Spiritomb. Without Ice Beam, we can't freeze the Spiritomb. And without Dig... If it weren't for that Lucario, we might be able to get away with just using Crunch. But unfortunately, Lucario is the scariest Pokemon. And I would like to knock it out in one hit. Crunch would be resisted, and I just didn't want to chance it. So I just kept trying. Again, and again, and again, and again. While I was at my wit's end, I just wanted to go to sleep and we had a lot of viewers watching the channel. I wanted to give them a victory, but as it would turn out, I was getting sick, and I was starting to feel really, really gross. This was going to be my last attempt of the night, and I said as much on stream. I just was really, really exhausted. And of course, in what I called my final attempt, we get a freeze. But that's just part one. We now need it to stay frozen while I set up my substitute. It does. Now we set up workup number one. Spiritomb stays frozen. On to workup number two. Spiritomb stays frozen. Workup number three. Spiritomb stays frozen. That's huge, but only just the beginning. Now will Lucario use Nasty Plot one more time? It does. Oh my, this, we're going to get another real attempt out of this. We're easily going to be able to knock out the Lucario using Dig. And as we saw, even a critical hit Rock Tomb from Gastrodon doesn't do enough to... What? No, no, wait, you know what? All is not lost. We could easily set up another substitute, and if we stall enough, we will still be at full HP, pretty much in an identical situation to last time, 
Please, Rock Tomb, please. Yes! All right, that was definitely not something I expected to have happen. Also, it's probably smarter to go for Ice Beam, hopefully. Yes, it knocks it out. This is, in fact, a defensively bulky Gastrodon, so that's great. We get one more Power Point of Dig for Milotic. But before we have to deal with Milotic, the Rose Raid is going to come out. It would be super nice if you don't attack me. All right, you know what? Same exact situation. Same situation, more power points on dig. Hopefully it should work out. If I'm smart, I can even time substitutes with recover. Oh God. All right, let's go for dig. Obviously it's gonna be burned by the flame orb and well, we already know how much damage that's gonna do. No, okay. Didn't burn me, that's good. If I could just clutch out a crit, we win. Please, please Bidoof, please crit, please. No, that's not a crit. Another scald and... <laughs> We've spent so long on this battle. Why did it have to burn? Why? Oh my God. Well, this battle is over. Dig is now gonna do like nothing. I knew she was going to heal here, so I'm going to use Ice Beam because what else am I supposed to do? Maybe I get a Clutch Freeze. No, but I do get a crit, so we know how much a critical hit Ice Beam does. Yay, I guess. Well, okay, let's find out how much Dig will do while burned. So we have to wait a turn and go for it. And it hits me and I survive. <laughs> okay. Thankfully, Lefties actually gives me HP before the burn takes it away, or I would lose. And at this point, I think I'm going to give it over to past j -Rose because you simply will not believe what happens next. Oh my god, it survived. Oh my god, I survived! <laughs> this is so dumb. Alright, uh... Does she just have Garchomp left? Yep. Well, okay guys, there is a slim chance. So we need either to survive on one HP or we need Garchomp to miss because it loves me so much. Will the power of love do enough? The power of love. A Yachi Berry. <laughs> the power of love. <laughs> Thanks for watching, everyone. Take care.